in the mid-90s, before same-sex marriage was a big political issue, the gay conservative writer Andrew Sullivan wrote a book called Virtually Normal. Uh, Mr. Sullivan isn't always described as a conservative anymore, in part because of his vocal opposition to some of the policies of George W. Bush. But at the time, there was no question that Andrew Sullivan was a conservative. Uh, part of the way you could tell he was a conservative was that his book, Virtually Normal, argued for gay marriage. See, as recently as 1996, when that book came out, gay marriage was seen as a fundamentally conservative idea. Like in many civil rights movements, there had long been tensions between the revolutionaries and the reformers in gay politics. People who wanted liberation, who wanted to overturn the social institutions that excluded some people and made up an unfair system, and people who didn't want to overturn anything. They just wanted everybody to be able to have access to those existing institutions. The gay marriage fight that has been waged ever since shows that the gay rights movement, in some ways, picked the more conservative option, which you would never know by the way that the conservative movement has reacted to the issue of gay marriage. Conservatives are so opposed to gay marriage that they proactively put anti-gay marriage constitutional amendments on state ballots. The anti-gay animus they have used the idea of gay marriage to stir up has been so politically important to them that it was part of the Republican Party's election strategy for 2004 to turn out voters motivated by the desire to vote against gay marriage and then count on those voters also voting for the other conservative choices on the ballot that year, namely President Bush and other Republican candidates. But for all of the anti-gay marriage conservative activism and agitation and political exploitation, Something has happened in the past year that has brought the gay marriage issue back to its conservative roots, in a way. Last spring, a man considered by many to be the leading conservative lawyer of his generation, present at the founding of the Federalist Society, he defended Ronald Reagan during the Iran-Contra affair, perennial Supreme Court nominee Minchin, uh, George W. Bush's first solicitor general, Ted Olson. He called the lead attorney he had squared off against in Bush v. Gore before the Supreme Court. And he asked his courtroom opponent, David Boyce, if he would like to work together with him to try to overturn California's anti-gay marriage Proposition 8 in federal court. Again, this would not be Ted Olson versus David Boyce again, but rather Ted Olson and David Boyce together against the opponents of gay marriage. If you're wondering why the conservative case for gay marriage is the cover story on Newsweek right now, it's because of our next guests. Joining us from California, where they are in the midst of their federal court battle over California's anti-gay marriage constitutional amendment, Proposition 8, are David Boyce and Ted Olson. Gentlemen, thank you so much for your time tonight. Thank you. Thank you, Rachel. Uh, Mr. Olson, let, let me start with you. I have um, read the legal arguments you've made in favor of same-sex marriage. I've read your opening statement from the trial from this week. But what moved you personally uh, to take this on, to wade into this fight? Well, I think it's the right fight to battle. It's the right time to fight this battle. Um, David and I agree that it isn't a liberal or conservative battle. It's an issue about American, um, American rights, American decency, American values, liberty, and equal treatment of individuals who are American citizens just like the rest of us. We think it's time that we recognize their right to equal treatment. Mr. Boyce, I know there was some initial controversy when you and Mr. Olson announced you would be taking on this case uh, together, in part because this is you're, you're stepping into the stream of a fight that's already been being waged before you and, uh, and through, through different means. Why pursue this as a federal issue? Everybody's guess is that this is aimed straight at a Supreme Court challenge on this issue. One of the reasons that it has to be a federal issue is that the federal constitution guarantees every citizen the right to equal protection of the laws. Gay and lesbian couples are being denied that protection. Now it's true that you can proceed state by state and nobody thinks that that's not a good idea. It's fine to proceed state by state. But as we've seen in a number of cases, the state by state battle has not succeeded. And in those cases, like California, and like my home state of New York, it's important that the federal constitutional guarantee of equal protection be vindicated. 
In the introduction um, to talking to you two, I mentioned that gay people seeking the right of marriage was initially seen, particularly within the gay community, as a pretty conservative course for the movement. Um, Mr. Olson, I know you wrote uh, in Newsweek this week that the fact that individuals who happen to be gay want to share in this vital social institution, marriage, is evidence that conservative ideals enjoy widespread acceptance. I want to ask you, though, about the conservative legal argument that a federal ruling for gay marriage would be seen as activist judging. As Mr. Boyce said, so far the record of the states when they put these things up to a popular vote is something like 0 and 31. What's the argument for securing this right through the courts when it's been so roundly rejected at the ballot box? Well, the federal courts, the Supreme Court of the United States has repeatedly recognized what you said, um, that marriage is a fundamental right of Americans in this country. It is the building block of our community. People who wish to enter into a loving, permanent relationship um, and wish to bond themselves together and share their aspirations and future uh, are, is a conservative value. I also, I don't think that, I don't want to claim that as a conservative value necessarily because it's a liberal value too. It's an American value, but the idea that people want to live together and be a part of a community and help build things together for themselves and for their family is certainly a conservative value, but it's also a liberal and, a, and an American value. When I hear you talk about that human, the, hum, the human side of this and the, what people go through when they are, uh, when they are deprived of civil rights. Um, I know that on, 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 I, I'm hearing both an, an argument there that's compelling in a rhetorical sense, but also I'm hearing legal strategy. Uh, Mr. Boys, I know that you have been involved in a lot of different civil rights issues over the course of your career. Legally, you've talked about the need to humanize the victims of civil rights violations. I, I know in the fight this week, you guys have asked witnesses what have sometimes been seen as personal questions about their life experiences as gay people. Is that part of the legal strategy? Absolutely, because... There are three basic points that we want to make. One is that marriage is a fundamental right, and nobody can really disagree with that. The second is that gay and lesbian couples are seriously harmed when they're deprived of that right. It harms them, it harms the children that they're raising and that they want to raise. And one of the ways of expressing that in the court is to bring these people in and let people hear what their stories are. And I don't think anybody in the courtroom who was there yesterday when these plaintiffs testified could go away unmoved by their stories. And the third point is that allowing them to be married doesn't hurt anybody. It doesn't hurt heterosexuals. I mean, you can't imagine, you know, heterosexuals in love deciding we're not going to get married because our gay neighbor can get married. There simply isn't any harm to anyone that, in allowing these people to marry the people that they love. And the way that you make that real is by bringing the people into court so everybody can see what they want, how they are, that they're just like you and me, and all they want are the same things that you and I take for granted, the right to go out and marry the person that we love. In making, um, Mr. Olson, what you called the um, conservative case, uh, for gay marriage in, in, in Newsweek. And I hear you saying this is American values. These aren't conservative or liberal values. But you wrote um, that you had been overwhelmed by expressions of gratitude and goodwill from persons in all walks of life, including from many conservatives and libertarians whose names might surprise. Uh, I, of course, would love to hear some of those names if you're at liberty to share them. But, <laughs> but, but even if you're not, can I ask you, is there more private acceptance of homosexuality among conservatives than people are willing to admit to publicly? Yes, I believe there is um, more private acceptance of homosexuality, especially among young people. This country is changing and it's changing rapidly. The acceptance of people that aren't exactly like us uh, is growing and growing in America. Also, what, one of the things that David and I hope to accomplish with this trial, and we hope that television will be a part of this trial at some point during this case, is to look into the hearts 
on souls of the people that we're representing. The story that David was mentioning that was told yesterday by the individuals we represent is very compelling. If you listen to these individuals and you hear our arguments, you are going to agree with us. And if we have the opportunity to spread that message throughout the country, as this case gives us an opportunity to do, more and more people will accept the decency and, and equality that our Constitution requires. So I think there is increasing acceptance of the fact that there are people that are different in our society, but they are otherwise just like us, and that that will increase as people are educated if they will just listen. Attorneys David Boyce and Ted Olson, part of the reason that people are listening is because you two are a very mm -hmm. odd couple standing there together. Uh, we really <laughs> appreciate you both coming on with us uh, tonight. Thank you for your time. Good luck. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you.